Hi, everyone. Welcome to Bisa Butler Live in Conversation. We're very excited to have you join us tonight. Um, we will begin now. Of course, we're going to have an exciting conversation, so we should get started. I'm going to first review a couple things about Zoom. We are in a webinar, which means we cannot see or hear any of our attendees. We would love for you to engage with us by using the chat function. You can find that at the bottom of your screen and make sure it is set to all panelists and attendees because um, it might be set just to the panelists. So if you want to send a message for everyone to see, just be careful of that and feel free to engage in conversation comments. And at the end of our event today, the last few minutes will be reserved for questions from the audience. If you would like to submit a question for BISA, you can do that through the Q&A function. That is also at the bottom of your screen. If you have any technical questions or issues, please feel free to put a message in the chat and I will assist you. Thank you so much. And now I will pass it off to our executive director, Michael Gitlitz. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Gatoni Museum of Art's second conversation with Bisa Butler. And thank you to Michelle for organizing this. Uh, for those of you who don't know, we very proudly have on view at our museum right now uh, the exhibition Bisa Butler Portraits, which closes on Sunday, October 4th, and will go to the Art Institute of Chicago. So I hope that you all have a chance to see the exhibition uh, here or in Chicago or both. Uh, Bisa's work has now joined the collections of some of the world's most important museums. Um, but we're very proud to say that this is the first solo museum exhibition of her work. And uh, it's, it's been very popular and I wanna thank the staff of the CAMA for organizing uh, the exhibition. Uh, one of the things I think that I wanna point out before I start talking to Bisa is that she really has the values of um, family and uh, being somebody who, who stays close to home. You know, she trained at Howard University uh, and then in Montclair, and she taught for 13 years, but she still lives and works in New Jersey, except that now she's really concentrating, I would say full-time, but it's more like double full-time on producing her work. And uh, so we've talked about her background in our last conversation. We talked about uh, several of the works in the current exhibition at the Katona Museum of Art. And what we're going to do today is we're going to talk about uh, some other things, some other works we didn't get to in the show. And then we'll talk about a rather extraordinary new work uh, of Bisa's that no one has yet seen. So without further ado, Bisa, I'm so happy that you are here with me. It's great to have you. Oh, I'm honored to be here, Michael. I had to get everything in because I know once I, I hand it off to you, I'm just gonna be mesmerized like before and <laughs> <laughs> no. do all the speaking. Um, <laughs> I, I know that, that we talked about the, the first work that we wanted to show everybody was your really incredible, although small in scale work called uh, One Vote Can Change the World. So that is going to go up on your screen. There it is. And, uh, you know, it's interesting because you and I have talked about the fact that you now in the last year or so feel mm -hmm. a sort of increased um, urgency or importance of making an overt political or social statement in your work. In some of the works that's the early works, it, it can be a little more uh, hidden. So mm -hmm. talk about this work and about that new urgency of yours. I mean, this particular artwork was made back in 2008. And I was actually invited to be a part of a quilt show. Um, this was the Women of Color Quilters Network started by Dr. Carolyn Meslumi. And she put out the call to quilters in the network to create a piece of artwork that would be exhibited during Barack Obama's inauguration. And uh, specifically, because some of the artists like me were portrait artists and I mean, quilting, quilters can do all kinds of things, you know, landscapes, abstract, uh, social commentaries. But she asked specifically 
for there not to be 50 portraits of Barack Obama. So we each had to dig a little deeper. And I thought, so this was my own personal reflection on what it was like basically to stand in line. And that was one of the first elections I can say that I felt so personally involved. And I mean, unfortunately I wasn't as engaged prior to that, but this was the election that sort of electrified and that I saw people waiting in line to vote. I mean, we'll see that now with the COVID crisis. And so th this is an image from, for, from what I saw at uh, Marshall Elementary School where I was voting. And then the idea about one vote can change the world. And I think a lot of us here, you realize just how much, you know, political policy on a micro or even on a macro level can affect us. Um, we think about even internationally, I know that sometimes um, our policies affect other people in other countries and vice versa. We've seen a lot of cross uh, cross culturalization there with this with the past election, and I'm sure again with this one coming up. Um, and so I felt like this piece sort of said for me what I wanted to at that time, and it's it suits again, and it, it should have suited at all times. That's that's fantastic. Do you, you're not one of these people, are you? That's not you in the. <laughs> no, but those are some of my genes that are cut up in the piece. Um, and then the background, I want to say that I had to paint that flag. And I come from a painting background. And I'm really like, I'm kind of resentful when I have to paint now because there's so much fabric. And I feel like if I look long enough, I can find sort of a fabric that can suit any purpose. But I remember having to paint that background and just opening up my old paint box and mixing the colors and finding like, it wasn't hard or anything, but it is a change of mode, you know, adding water and paint and liquid when you're used to dealing with soft and dry materials, very pliable materials that you touch with your own hands and a paintbrush, you're kind of separate from it. And the figure in the wheelchair, I have an, um, an auntie who was in, in a sort of walker slash wheelchair like that. So that wasn't her, but I was thinking of, you know, those people who are also older mm -hmm. and those people who are disabled or differently abled who would definitely make that struggle and get out there and vote. That's, that's interesting. I was going to raise the point that it's one of the only works with paint on it. And I don't know whether this makes you feel good or not, but I, there are so many people who will stand in front of a work next to me and insist that this part is painted or that part is painted. And I you know, <laughs> have to patiently explain, no, it's, it's all done with, with fabric. Do you yeah. um, just, <laughs> I don't know how you feel about that. If Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, it became a personal challenge for me not to use paint. I think I was rebelling against paint altogether, the smell of it, um, the toxicity of it. And so I moved so far from that. Although I was an art teacher for 13 years, so my students were always painting. But that was one thing because it wasn't in my studio. So mm -hmm. I considered like my studio a dry studio. And you know, the classroom, it can be wet and messy in different ways. And uh, so nowadays, I'm really not interested in painting on my own. Um, although once I switch into that mode, if I am painting something, I do find that I enjoy it. But I think it uses a different part of the brain and it's kind of hard sometimes to transition over like that. And I will say that I forgot to mention that this piece exhibited in DC during Barack Obama's inauguration at one of the Smithsonian's, although I forget exactly which one it was, and that I have never been to a more packed exhibit in my life. I don't know if people could even see it at that time. I mean, it was really wall-to-wall -wall humanity. Well, you'll be pleased uh, to know that the uh, director of the Smithsonian American Museum of Art was in to see your exhibition, Stephanie uh, Stibich, uh, last oh, wow. week, two weeks ago. And 
she wrote a very lovely and glowing note about it. So. Oh, that's so wonderful. Thank you for telling me that. I want to switch gears a little bit here um, sure. to talk about, again, about the, the political nature of your work, but how you deal with that subject when it's an historical event. So if we go to the next image, the next work, uh, we will see your work titled uh, Four Little Girls. Uh, are we? Yeah, we'll switch in a minute. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Anyway, while Michelle is um, getting the PowerPoint to do what we want it to do, there we go. Do you, do you want to talk about um, why you chose this title? Because I find it fascinating that some people look at the, the title with just the date and the place and they immediately know that this is a representation that refers to the four that were bombed in the church bombing. Whereas other people d really don't, it's, it's unknown to them. And I, right. you know, I find it somewhat embarrassing because it's almost always the white viewers who don't know just by the date and the black viewers right. who isn't that interesting? Um, because I would say probably all of us, black and white, are miseducated in, in knowing and learning about the African American contributions to this country. And, you know, a lot of times that'll be relegated to Black History Month, which I always had a problem with because we've been involved in the building of this country from the start. So it's kind of like if you taught half of a history lesson because of racial prejudice, but then everybody who's being taught that does not know the lesson. So um, September 15th, 1963, um, I was referring to the bombing that happened in Birmingham, Alabama at the uh, 16th Street Baptist Church. And I really, I usually am not interested in images that show people as suffering or people as hurting. And it's not that those instances don't exist, but I want people to think about my work like a, a snapshot from an African-American family and what you find inside that book. So all the, the four little girls who had passed away, who were killed in the bombing, they had vibrant lives and communities and they had families who loved them. And they were there early in the church for Sunday school. I think it was Children's Day that day. And, you know, their parents got up early. I watched the documentary a little bit earlier, but their parents pressed their hair. One little girl's mother had washed and pressed her hair that morning. Um, um, another one of the children, she had to go inside and get a shorter slip because her mother told her her slip was showing. Um, and... That was the last time her mother got to speak to her to tell her to fix her little slip. So I thought about these children as living and vibrant and happy prior to that moment. They had no idea this was coming and their suffering was quick and violent. So I wanted to focus on the moments before. What were they like? Just like any other little children. So I intentionally chose a moment where they could just be laughing amongst themselves. You know, one little girl mm -hmm. might look up more like the show off. Another might be one that's shy. And these four children, I want to say in my piece, it's, I didn't study photographs of the four little girls. I just thought about four little African-American girls as representing all black little girls. And mm -hmm how all of them then and now, including young women like Breonna Taylor, um, their lives are circumspect. You know, in a moment, if you hate somebody because of their skin color, that hate can go into indifference or it could also turn into murder, just out and out murder. And that's what this piece represented for me. So in some ways, and Michelle, if we could just show the, the two slides of the details of this work so you can see the individual character that you've brought out in each of these girls. Um, on one level, it, it is this kind of homage to these specific girls. And in another, it's a statement about um, 
what events constitute black history as opposed to American history, as to you know, how people can be disenfranchised simply by not acknowledging uh, an important event like this. Yeah, and so when you said that some people come and they pr primarily tend to be black people who will know the date, September 15th, 1963, they know what happened. I wonder if those are people, because some of my friends spoke to me about it afterwards and said that they, well, one of my friends, Dr. Mazzalumi, said that she was in um, Alabama. She was in college at the time and that her parents heard about the bombing and wanted her to come home right away. So I'm wondering if some of the people who know the date lived through it in some mm -hmm. way or another, they actually saw the newspaper um, titled, maybe they saw it on TV or heard it on the radio at the time. And then some of us may have had some extra curricular educational things. Like my, my mother used to, my mother put me and my sister and my brother in a Afrocentric or African-centered school curriculum. Mm -hmm. So, but if you're going through a typical American educational curriculum, I think that this entire, the church bombing, maybe it's a paragraph, and that's a maybe, maybe three yeah. or four lines, and that's the end of that. But it should also become part of our national conversation. I'm quite sure that some of the people who saw this uh, knew the date because it was mentioned in their family when that date came along. Today's yeah. the day that the same way so many people, you know, will say, oh, the day, you know, that Pearl Harbor was bombed, you know, they right. have September 11th. Uh, there are certain dates in our history that we really, you know, talk about, even if they're not recognized as a national holiday. Yeah. And it's interesting that when I started making this piece, I posted it online. And um, I think I had posted three of the little girls online. Mm -hmm. And then somebody right away was like, oh, it's the four little girls from mm -hmm. the church bombing so they knew right away and that's how I felt like it was important it was important but it also wasn't necessary for me to make this portrait of the four slain children but make this represent all mm -hmm. black little girls mm -hmm. so you universalized it thank you that that was a, a great explanation uh, I want to turn now to your really wonderful work, uh, Black Lives Matter, and uh, here you talk about your admiration for uh, Basquiat and how you ended up creating the combination of these two subjects. Yeah, I think of Jean-Michel Basquiat as this incredibly talented young black man, but he also, he, I felt like he was lost to us. Like he got caught up in the undertow of money and excess and, and drugs. Um, and, you know, his death was one of those that they say is either accidental suicide or so, but even before he actually passed away. I felt like the art world in itself had sort of swallowed him up mm -hmm. and, and um, removed him from his community and it left him kind of isolated. You know, from what I had heard, he grew up in a middle-class family in Brooklyn and they were Puerto Rican and Haitian. Um, but him being a young man in, in the eighties with all these like famous people a lot of money going around, a lot of drugs. I feel like he was separated from his essence, from his roots. You know, he wasn't with his family at that time. And unfortunately, like that fast living, his physiology, however it was, he wasn't able to survive it. <clears throat> he got recognition from the art gallery world and people were buying his work and saying he was amazing but he didn't have any museum shows in his lifetime. Um, the art hierarchical world was just sort of accepting street art, but then not really. And, you know, he's only gained and gained prominence since then. So I combined 
Jean-Michel Basquiat with these other people who I felt like were lost ones to us, mm -hmm. lost to the community for mm -hmm. one way or another. A lot of these people on here, I called it the Black Lives Matter because the people who I mentioned were people who were killed by police or people mm -hmm. who were unarmed or um, even the, the other church killing in Charlottesville. Uh, I mentioned Reverend Clementa Pinckney because those were also innocent people who were just killed by racists. Mm -hmm. uh, one racist person came in and killed them. And I was working on this piece while I was teaching at, I think I was at American History High School at the time in Newark. And my students were responding to the death. At the time, if I can remember right, I thought it was Tamir Rice. Mm -hmm. And because Tamir was only 12, that affected the children very deeply because they could see mm -hmm. themselves in that. He was like a little brother or mm -hmm. he could be them. And another one of my students was making a piece and she had all of these names on this artwork. I think she must have had at least 35 names on there. And then, so even mine was just like a snapshot just a few of the people who had been unjustly killed by, by some byproduct of racism. And now, if I were to make this piece, I don't even know how big it would really have to be. And not even to say that these names were it. I mean, we know that Black people have been lynched or murdered for being Black for a very long time, but we didn't have the names. You know, when George Floyd was killed on camera, mm. the difference was like on camera. Then now it's undeniable um, what we have been saying all along. And to have his name on here and all of the people who have recently passed and in the present, I mean, it wouldn't even be possible. I, I wondered whether, you know, what's happened in the subsequent a year since you made this work um, has given you a desire to make a new work or an updated larger work. And, and of course you couldn't <clears throat> possibly fit uh, everybody, but it's... Yeah. I find now that I tend to be a little more hyper fixated and trying to do one person at a time. Mm -hmm. So I just don't, it's not really so much my interest to have everyone's name on there because I do think mm -hmm. about that like an icon as well, you know. Mm -hmm. One person who is a martyr or who dies for a cause, whether they knew it or not, can represent many. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm more interested and I do think about um, my upcoming pieces and how I'd like to memorialize some of the people who have been lost to us, but maybe like really just honing in on that one person and putting everything that I can into it. Mm -hmm. um, be besides the people who have died at the hands of uh, police violence, do you feel like since Jean-Michel Basquiat died that there are other artists or cultural figures that have also been drawn away from their their roots, their family, their community. I know the family and community is so central to who you are and to your work. Um, yeah. That I just wondered if that's something you continually look for. Um, I do look for my artist icons. Um, but I think in particular about Jean-Michel Basquiat, I think it's that he had parents who were, well, his father who was foreign born. So I find like a kinship with that. My father is from Africa. His father was from Haiti. Um, I had an older brother who I lost. Um, gosh, I think it's been about nine years now. And so in a way, I guess I'm associating he, Jean-Michel Basquiat as an older brother and mm. me actually knowing his younger sisters as in myself, you know, every piece does, does tend to be like a portrait of yourself in a way, or you're saying something about yourself. So when I think of Jean-Michel Basquiat and his loss, 
I'm thinking about my own loss of my own big brother mm -hmm. and my own father who was like, well, is my father's listening in now, but <laughs> my father was a college president. Yeah. yeah. Hey dad. Um, he was a college president for 40 years. And I know Jean-Michel Basquiat's father, I think was a banker. Um, he worked in finance. So they're the kind of men who wear suits and, work really hard and have very high expectations for their children. But, and, and as far as other artists who I feel are lost to our community, I think more so now I see it with, um, with visual art, uh, excuse me, with musical artists, mm -hmm. because they're, they're more prevalent. So you see them as more out there, but you think about like people like Michael Jackson or Prince, you know, there does tend to be an isolation when you reach a certain level of stardom. And if you don't have family with you to guide you and help you, then you, you do, you can get lost. Do you think that that was an, an influence on your uh, work, Dear Mama, with that homage to Tupac Shakur in, in many ways? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can tell, like, I'm sort of, I'm always longing for those who are gone. Mm -hmm. And actually that's how I started choosing vintage photos from the beginning. It started with me making a portrait of my grandmother who was in fact dying at the time. Her kidneys were failing. So I wanted to like hold on to a piece of her. And then after she passed, it became holding on to the stories that she told me. How do we remember those things mm -hmm. when it's just oral history? You know, either I'm gonna write a book about my grandmother's life or I'm going to create artwork based on the stories that she told me. And those stories have now morphed into the story of the African-American community. You know, if it's mm -hmm. not written in the history books, if it's not taught in our schools, if it's not on regular TV, then when are people black and white going to hear the true story of black people? So an artist, you have an opportunity to share that part of yourself, share it with the world. And now it's not just an opportunity. I feel like it's my responsibility. Mm -hmm. If I know the truth about Black people, then it's my responsibility to share that with people. Otherwise, what is my point? So this is a great segue into the next work in that you one aspect of your work is the personalizing of a famous event or a famous person as in the four little girls and uh, Basquiat and then the other aspect is taking an anonymous photo a photograph of of people that we don't know and personalizing them and turning them into heroes and giving them this sort of uh, nobility and I think that your work, the first work that I ever saw of yours, which was Safety Patrol, is a great uh, example of that. So uh, yeah. we have some great detail shots of this, but also, but do you want to talk about how this represents the, the importance of, of safety and community and how sure. this came about? The Safety Patrol, I did this piece actually my last year as a teacher. I think it was like the last couple of months I was getting ready to, the school year was ending. I was working at Columbia High School. Graduation was coming up. And um, I was working around children all day long, you know, all day and into the night in their after school programs and Saturdays. So me doing a piece that centered around children just really was exactly what my life was. And I saw this photo by um, Charles Harris, Charles Teeny Harris out of Pittsburgh. Um, it was taken in 1949. And I thought, oh, I would love to make my version of this photo into a quilt. I loved the sight of this young man in the front and the way he was the leader. You know, I, a lot of times my students, and there was an incident at my high school, at Columbia High School, where some black kids, they were at the park. I don't know if it was the 4th of July or what, but I think it may have been. But the kids were at the park and they were there to be a part of the festivities. And after the event, people were dispersing. The kids were kind of hanging around. Park was still open. 
And the um, neighborhood police saw this group of black kids and decided that they didn't belong there and sort of herded them out of the town into the edges of the town and had them go into another neighborhood that wasn't their neighborhood. I mean, actually pushed them out of town late at night. And it was because the police saw that they didn't belong. Mm. And they lumped them all together. You're a bunch of black kids or you must be some bad kids. And so the safety patrol, to me, it looked like how I see my children. You know, there are those students who are the class leaders. They're smart and they're brave and they're responsible. Their teachers know them and they're respected. So that's the little boy who would be out front. He has his- You wanna show the detail of that boy so that we can really see Yeah, hopefully. Oh, there he is. So you can see that he has a piece of kente that's going across him. So instead of his safety patrol belt, I use a piece of kente from, that's from my, my ancestry in Ghana. Kente is used for royalty and to show a dignitary. It's used for special events. It's hand woven only by men. Um, actually, it might be woven by women now, but traditionally it was only woven by men, but it was for everyone. So I put that across him like his badge of honor. And the OK print, that's a Nigerian type of cloth is on him because I thought, I want this to represent that these kids are okay. I mean, simultaneously, while I was making this, Trayvon Martin had, was beat and then murdered on the lawn in Florida by mm -hmm. the, um, I think it was the neighborhood, neighborhood Watch guy. Mm -hmm. And I was so disturbed by upset, enraged, like in tears, and my dad was telling me, and if he was here, if he, I'm sure he's listening, but I remember him telling me, like, calm down, that he said that the world that is coming is not your world or mine, it's theirs, and the kids will know how to handle it. And even now, I have to sort of repeat that mantra, because I see things that seem so disturbing, so scary. And our children are viewing this and growing up in this. So I hope and pray that they're getting stronger by it and smarter. Um, but that okay on him was like, I want to believe that the kids will be okay. And the eye on his chest, um, that particular fabric made in Ghana, um, the eye can represent many things, but the eye of Horus, like if you go back to the ancient Egyptian symbol, is a protection. Um, it can also be like a third eye, like seeing into the spiritual side of life. And also, um, I think it's an Arab and um, Israeli or Jewish iconography, you know, the evil eye, but that eye wards away evil in itself. So I was trying to put all of these things. Oh yeah, and Annette Garland, she just said windows to the soul, but the eye is there on his heart. And I want this child to be, to be strengthened by all of these amulets on him. And he is protecting his classmates. And he's also in the line of fire. And his arms out like that was also like protective and at the same time sacrificial. And then I love the other children's looks. You know, some of them are cautious, some of them are shy. You know, they don't have the same energy because uh, they're not the leader, but they all have these sweet expressions. And that's what I was thinking about my students as well, as they got herded out of the park, that the officers have no idea who these children really are. Which kid is the troublemaker? Which one is the sweetheart? Which mm -hmm. one It was the younger sister who had to be brought along because they're being babysat by the eldest? Like, also, earlier today, when I was reading about um, the four little girls, another thing I didn't realize was that there were five girls, but one survived. And she was the little sister who was also in the bathroom. She lost the sight in one of her eyes. Um, glass shards just destroyed her vision. Um, but that she was the witness to that and that she was the one child who has been really forgotten and left out and I felt kind of guilty that I didn't put her in the portrait. Mm, that's interesting. While, while we have this slide up, can you also talk about um, the different faces? 
which we know are made up of hundreds of different pieces of fabric and how you are using the different colors to either express a personality or to consciously um, avoid the tendency to uh, make judgments based on tone, uh, sure. colorism. Right, right. Yeah, um, that, that, thank you for asking that. Because there are two things that I'm doing here. The boy in the front, you'll see that his face is mostly red and orange and yellow. And I like using color as a form of communication. You know, in our society and in many, though, red is looked at the color of our blood, you know, the color of power. That's Mars, you know, the god of war, um, passion, anger. So I'm looking at, oh, I think even in the Yoruba um, tradition, red is thought of this, um, a god named Shango, who's also really powerful. So I wanted that boy in the front deliberately for him to be red. And then you see his, his friend who's kind of right behind his shoulder is more blues and green. Mm -hmm. Because I think of blue and, and we do tend to think of blue associated with what things in nature are blue, like the sky, like the water, it can be calm or cooler. So I wanna show that these two children have very different personalities and very different things that they're doing in this portrait. And then also like you were talking about for colorism, a lot of times when, uh, I guess when a white person describes a black person, the very first thing they might say, well, well, he was black, okay. But for black people, we'll say this person, he was light skinned or he was dark skinned. And then we'll go on with the other description. He was tall, he was short, he was heavy set, or she had curly hair, she had straight hair. But the first thing we usually mention is what tone, what skin tone was that? And because that's very important um, in America, and I think most all of our European colonized societies, especially where there was slavery, if those slaves were mixed with the slave owner, they're going to be lighter. You know, they're going to be biracial people. And they're going to most likely been given easier jobs. You can work inside because somehow, you know, you're less, you're less wild. You're more civilized because you're half white. So you can work inside the house. You can be a cook, you can be the driver or whatever the case may be. And you're actually a blood relative of your master. And that has, that tradition, unfortunately, has carried into the modern day that still when you look in, on TV, you know, who are the most famous, beautiful actresses that we always talk about. And it's no, this or offense on Halle Berry or Beyonce or any of them. They are beautiful, but there's a certain look that they still are, tend to be lighter skin. And darker skin is still looked at like these people are somehow blacker, although their DNA could be exactly the same. So blacker can, can mean better or worse. And I don't wanna get into that with my pieces, in my own family, we have a variety of skin tones, but I have a sister who's listening on, who looks very much like me. People used to say we were twins. We're a year apart, a little less than a year. So we're twins for two weeks every year, but I'm dark skin, she's light skin. And so when we were little, people would come up to us and be like, they would look right at her and say, you are so adorable. So they wouldn't say like, you, you're ugly to me, but there would be no comment whatsoever. Mm -hmm. We could have our hair exactly the same, <laughs> dresses the same, everything. Mm -hmm. So I really, um, somebody mentioned Lupita Nyong'o's children's book about skin color. And I did see that and I thought how important it is to, to talk about that right away because children say it right out. They're not gonna be subtle about it. Even my high school kids, who I just left, so I know they're still doing it, but they would get in arguments in class on who was lighter and who was darker. Mm -hmm. And this is not something that they would hide. They would come up to me as a teacher and then ask me my opinion, who mm -hmm. was lighter. And then I would tell them to go sit back down and I wasn't gonna engage mm -hmm. in that type of negative conversation, but they didn't understand why it was negative and the mm -hmm. roots of that. So I would go over and it would become this whole lesson. I'm the art teacher, <laughs> but as teachers know, you become a lot more than that. You become a friend, you become confidant, 
to become mother and father, depending on it, social worker. So my pieces, my children in this piece, I don't want it to be obvious what shade. I want them to be obviously black. So I'm not using color to say like, oh, color doesn't matter. I want my children to be obviously African-American, but I don't want it to be obvious what skin tone are they? Are they light or mm -hmm. dark? Are they medium? We don't know. We don't know. Is their, their hair curly? Or ki now, usually I do really emphasize that their hair is kinky <laughs> because I want that to be like a sticking point. But whether the curls are big or loose or waves, I want that to show. But what I don't want to be obvious is how light or dark are they? Well, it's interesting that you're subverting that, uh, you know, that whole uh, uh, unconscious colorism that uh, exists and it must be even more difficult given that you're working from a uh, black and white photograph and so those tones are you know I guess some of the more obvious pieces of information you're getting from the work and so can you just mention I mean you've always been drawn to these the black and white photographs as opposed to color photographs is that right. Fair to say? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I am the type of person that I was always sitting next to my grandmother looking at her photo album. Um, my mother grew up in Morocco. Her father was a U.S. emissary. So she's got all these pictures of like these diplomats at these parties in the 60s. And this is right when color film, they, they had color film, but mostly all their photos were black and white. So I'm looking at snapshots of a life that I didn't have. You know, I grew up hearing about the princesses and pr the prince, um, I think it was, it was Muli Hassan and Lala, Lala Neza. So that Lala is princess Neza and Muli Hassan, he eventually, I found out later that Hassan Sank became this huge king of Morocco. But at, in their day, he was this handsome prince who they were all crushing on. So I grew up hearing the stories of their life like the Arabian Nights, but they were real. You know, the time they went to the desert and my aunts and got to meet um, Haile Selassie, the emperor of Ethiopia, and they had to hang out with his granddaughter. And, and the shenanigans that they got into were so fascinating to me. And the fact that this was their real life, but here I am growing up in South Orange, New Jersey, <laughs> completely removed from that. So those images were burned into my mind, which I think really, really dictates why I'm so drawn to black and white. And also I was a child in the 70s. So TV at first was still black and white. Some people had color TVs, but not that much. And then probably by, I guess it was like 1980, I felt like the transition was pretty quick. Like how we, we all transitioned to touch screen really quickly. You know, within a couple of years, everybody had color TV. But before that, we were all comfortable watching black and white and had no problem in our minds converting black and white into something that we thought was realistic. So now when I'm creating artwork, when I see color images, I feel like the color, well, first of all, we know with film, the color is not always right. This camera is deciding what these colors are, but it's not exactly the same colors that we see with our eyes. So I feel like I'm trying to resist the influence of machines in a way. Like, you don't tell me what color something is. I'll tell you what color I think it is. And I feel like black and white allows me to just be more creative with that and decide what color I want anything to be. All I need is the value scale, which is in black and white anyway. Okay, great. Um, and I think that will relate to... Uh, the next work uh, where we have several photos, this is the work that you've been uh, concentrating on, the Warmth of Other Suns for the last, what, six, seven months? Uh, yeah. This monster of a work that is going to the Newark Museum of Art. And yeah. uh, we'll sort of scroll back and forth through the various figures and details if you can talk about how this, this work uh, came about and what you're trying to do. Sure. Well. Um, this happened sometime in, I guess it was February, uh, the North Museum. 
came to visit me at my art exhibit at the Claire Oliver Gallery, which opened February 29th. So I think they visited some somewhere around like February 27th or 28th. And I had some of my new pieces up and they were asking me if I would be interested in doing like a large scale piece for their, for their museum. And the Newark Museum, I consider like my home museum. So I was born in Orange. Um, I grew up in South Orange and the biggest museum for us was the North Museum. That's where we used to go as children. Um, and then I worked in Newark for years. So we were always taking kids to the North Museum. We could walk there from the school where I was working at American History High. And I started looking through my archive of images and I really had this idea. I was reading the book by Isabel Wilkerson, The Warmth of Other Suns. And she spelled that S-U-N-S, -S, like suns as in the place. And I was so interested in capturing a snapshot of a family going through this transition, moving, leaving their life, leaving the South, leaving their friends, their family, and then going up to the North looking for a better life. And I wanted to really, I really wanted to do a whole generational piece. So you're seeing two people on the screen, but there's seven people in the finished piece of artwork. And there's a grandma and a grandpa. Right now, this is the grandfather and his granddaughter next to him. The grandma is also in the image, the two children, three the children, and then the, the mother and the father. And each, each person in the image, I wanted to make sure that they have those talismans to guide them on their journey and to help them. The grandpa, if you look closely. I don't know if we're able to zoom in on him a little bit so you can see his shirt, but you see words going down the middle of his shirt. It says, prenez soin de vous, which is, that means um, take care of you, or in other words, that means stay safe. That fabric was made in the Cote d'Ivoire during the COVID crisis, and I thought, what better fabric to put on this elderly man? You know, he's maybe almost 90 years old, if not older, and he's making this journey. So he's lived this life, living through racism, Jim Crow, and who knows what else that he went through. If, if you're leaving the South in 1940 and you're 90 years old, you know, this man, he was alive in the 1800s. So what had he seen? And putting like, take care of you, on him was like how I feel about elderly people, especially through the COVID crisis and black people who were, who have been particularly vulnerable to it, poor people, black people, elderly people, people with reduced immunity. I wanted like this bubble around them, like to take care of them and to protect them. And who is this figure to the right, which is, uh similar looking to the granddaughter, but she's- it's right. a another movie. granddaughter. Holding Michelle Obama's purse, is that what that, <laughs> yeah. that's, uh, that's yeah. how it is? Yeah, exactly, that fabric again. Um, this is, there are two sisters and my father did remind me that I'm doing that unconsciously, but like I said about, you're always creating your own story again. I'm the one in the family who has two sisters. So, and one brother. So in this piece, there's two sisters and there's a brother. And this young girl, in the original photo, she is clutching a purse. It's a white purse. And it is the only new thing that I think is in the photo. Her dress was raggedy. Her hat was ripped. Her shoes were more sock than shoe. Like they were so worn out that basically more than one toe, let's say if three toes are out. So you really just have the sole of the shoe and the laces were holding it together. But when I create my pieces, I want to give them what I think that they should have. She deserves to have shoes that are not ripped up and a new hat and a new purse. Her purse was new, but I gave her Michelle Obama's purse and that, I didn't name it Michelle Obama's purse. The company, Velisco, that produces it, called it that because African women in, in Ghana and the Cote d'Ivoire, when Michelle Obama visited um, Ghana with 
with Barack Obama. I always hesitate on his name, almost like she is, she comes before him in my mind. But when Michelle Obama stepped off Air Force One, looking chic in her shoes and handbag and designer clothes, the women in the marketplace right away said that fabric with those purses on it, Michelle Obama's purse, and then it sold out immediately. So I wanted this young girl to be carrying her own future in her hands Mm -hmm. and in her future, which would be unbeknownst to her, Michelle Obama would exist, you know, Mm -hmm. almost, almost 70 years later, becoming the first lady, but. Michelle, can you show the next slide, which is a close up of the, of the purse? There we go. So I'm sorry about the pins on there. I was still stitching when this piece was taken. Well, I think it's wonderful that we get to see the work in process. And one of the things I thought you were so gracious and open about was showing people how you audition the figures on different backgrounds and pin them and then try another background. And we have lots of questions I want to get to, many of which are about your process. Okay. Um, But I just, I don't want to cut you off if you want to, if we can scroll through these last few slides. and Sure, that's grandma and grandpa there. And then just one thing I wanted to note how they're holding hands. Mm -hmm. Um, I just like that idea of this enduring love and support. And I love the way grandma was so strong Mm -hmm. that it's almost like she's holding him up. Mm -hmm. It's it's absolutely a wonderful, it reminds me of the broom jumpers in some way, but like the other end of the story. Yeah, 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 Yeah. that's what I thought of. So uh, we, as I say, we do have, so many questions about do you hand quilt or machine quilt to which we know the answer is yes <laughs> <laughs> machine 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 for sure and the only hand thing that happens is uh maybe stitching on the sleeve in the back but almost 99.999 percent of everything i do is on machine i'm using a long arm that transition um, from hand stitching? Mm. I don't think I ever really hand stitched much. No, I just used to use a little, um, a little, um, home machine, which was like the mm-hmm. size of a lunchbox, you know? Mm-hmm. And then I switched over to use a more professional machine for quilting. I'm using the long arm quilting machine now. And for anybody who wants to see this, you can... Um, go on to the Katona Museum's website, katonamuseum.org, and we have links to uh, Visa Working that show this industrial machine <laughs> that you drive yeah. so delicately like a surgeon. <laughs> uh, and some people, I just saw somebody asking what long arm machine. I think once I had a, a mini long arm machine, but it was from a company in California, and and when it broke, it was a disaster because I had to ship it back to California. They shipped it back to me, got it, but it fell in the shipping. It was dented. And then I had to have an insurance claim. So it's not that I want to recommend one machine or another, but if you want to buy a long arm sewing machine, go into a sewing shop that sells them and get one that is close by your house so you can get it fixed. That's the best machine for you. One that they can build it in your house and they can fix it. Because it could break, and so, yeah, People don't don't do like that. Uh, exactly, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> uh, w- one of the questions which I thought was very interesting was about the use of various fabrics and prints that you, you know, obviously, you, as you pointed out, use the the kente, uh, and then you're using wax prints and and others. And do you? And you and I talked about this earlier today. Do you design your own uh, uh, fabrics, your own textiles? Which I also well, know, but you should speak about it. Yeah, I, I have not. Although my daughter um, was, she was a printmaking major at Pratt. Now she switched over to jewelry making, but she still has um, all of the knowledge that she learned the couple years in printmaking. And she actually did help me make like, we made like three yards of fabric. Because I told mm-hmm. her I wanted like fabric with um, black power fists on it, but I mm-hmm. wanted on African fabric. 
Mm. So the things that I'm wanting are like really specific. And so she was carving them out and printing them for me. But before that, no. I mean, mostly I'm using Dutch wax fabric right. that is from um, Galisco. That's the biggest manufacturer of Dutch wax and they're in Holland. Um, another fabric, um, what's it called? I think it's called Urban Threads. It's a company in London that does a lot of uh, Nigerian batik fabrics. Um, there's a woman, Lisa Shepard. She's right in Rahway, New Jersey. Cultural, is it cultural expressions, cultured expressions, if you want to look for her. She sells a lot of um, African fabric online. But I'm just basically trying to get all of the fabric from all of the places and then being able to just select in my own home what I want. So mm -hmm. I'm not thinking about it ahead of time. I'm not going into the store or on a shop like, yeah, I want blue, red, and orange. I just mm -hmm. go and I buy what I like. And then now I have my own resource at home that I can choose from. And th this leads to um, your process of auditioning the figures. If you want to talk about that for those people on sure. the Zoom who have, are not aware of it, because we have discussed it before. But Yeah, well, I'm mostly using domestic American fabrics for the background. I'm using a lot of upholstery fabrics or drapery fabrics dressmaking fabrics from the or from the regular fabric store. I go to the fabric warehouse here in New Jersey and I think they have three or four of them. And then I live uh, 20 minutes, 30 minutes outside of New York City. So the garment district is just open to me and I can get at discounted prices these big bolts. And as far as auditioning fabrics, like this particular piece, the warmth of other suns, I must have auditioned between 30 and might even have been 40 different fabrics, just trying to come up with the right combination that I wanted, the right colors, the right texture. And um, I need this whole piece. Let me say that the warmth of other suns is 10 feet, no, nine and a half feet tall and 12 feet wide. So I'm using huge amounts of fabric and I'm buying these bolts and then just laying all my figures on top of them, trying to see, do I like the way this is working out? And I can't pick that ahead of time. Cause if you look at this one alone, look at the man's face, look at his shirt, um, mm -hmm. look at the different colors. If I had chosen, I don't know, but let's say I chose green or red ahead of time. What if those are not the right greens or reds for him? You know, it's just, it's just not going to work. So I have to wait until all figures are done and then lay them all on those backgrounds before I can decide. So, I mean, it took me days and days and days to find the right background for this piece, but I think I finally did. So the, the image talks. on the left shows something that I think is really fascinating to me because I don't think you've done this before, but you're entering into a bit of a surrealist um, area with the, the horse, the I can run faster than my enemies. Do you want to talk about sure. what's happening? Well, I love that fabric um, that you just mentioned, Michael. I run faster than my enemies. Um, Le Cour de Cheval, I think that it's sold a lot in Togo and Cote d'Ivoire, the Francophone African um, marketplace. Those women call that I run faster than my enemies, meaning that you're going to succeed over people or things that are trying to stop you. So I use that fabric a lot and I put that on the young, so you're looking at a pants leg from the young boy. So it has a double meaning for me because yes, I want this little boy to succeed over his enemies when he's a little one and when he's older because unfortunately grown people who are, let's say if they have a problem with black people or they are racist, they'll consider him as a target. So I want him to be able to escape that. But then also he's just a little boy and he likes horses and likes to play with things. So I like the idea that sort of like the Toy Story thing, but the horse just really is just jumping right off of his pants and onto well, It's expressing his the exuberance of the figure of the boy in some way. Yeah. Okay. It's exuberance of the figure, but then it's also like, as he's staring at something like that, maybe his imagination imagines that the horse literally just jumped off and ran away and he could play. So we're, I wanna end on what I think is a fabulous question that really we should throw to your father, to Dr. Yamba to answer. Um, oh. 
at what age did you and your parents realize you were artistically talented? This is coming from the audience. Um, my dad, my father worked a lot when we were little. I mean, a lot. He was a, he was a young dean of, I forget what he was the dean of, but then he became the college president at Essex when I was six. So really I was home with my mom. And I remember my mother letting me draw these huge figures on the room. Well, she didn't let me. I drew these figures on the wall in my room. And they were like, they were pretty hideous. I remember what the body is real, real big and just have arms and legs sticking out. No, there's no body. I'm sorry. It's a huge head with just arms and legs. And I drew like 12 of them from big to little going all the way down my wall. And you didn't get in trouble for drawing on your wall? No, and the reason why I didn't get in trouble is because when my mother asked, why did I do that? Because I was afraid to sleep in my own bed. I always mm -hmm. wanted to sleep with them, and she wasn't going to let me anymore. I was about three or four, and I told her that those were my guardian angels. Mm -hmm. And so then she thought that was so sweet, and then she let me keep them there. <laughs> so There you have it, folks, yeah. three years old. Yeah making yes. her first guardian angel. Yeah, I was supported um, early on. <laughs> Bisa, I just want to thank you again. This was such a pleasure for, for me and I, I hope for our audience as well. And I want to thank all of you for joining in. We had, I think it was 390 people who signed up for this. So you have collectively raised almost $2,000 for Black Lives Matter this evening. Wow, and, wow. And uh, we're, we're so happy that you have... Uh, joined us and we hope that you will uh, come to the museum if you get a chance uh, go online and check us out you can uh, see our url below and also check out our gala which is coming up this uh, saturday october 3rd and it's our, our big fundraiser so join yeah. the gala and uh, thank you all and thank you bisa Thank you so much for having me, Michael. Thanks for everybody for joining. Thanks to all my students and my folks from Columbia High School and from North New Jersey.